now to uh, introduce the event a little bit further and to give us some context for the um, political questions about guns in Washington State uh, this year, I'd love to welcome to the stage Renee Hopkins, who is the Executive Director of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. Uh, Renee, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, and I really want to thank Pamela, who I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing here in a moment, for taking on this um, very complicated issue in our country today. For those of you that are not familiar with our work, the Alliance for Gun Responsibility is a Seattle-based nonprofit founded on the simple principle that gun violence is a public health epidemic, but it is preventable. And we focus on the preventable. Our mission is to create a culture of re responsible gun ownership in America through education, prevention programming, and legislative advocacy to strengthen common sense gun laws in our state and set an example for the country. We're probably best known for our direct ballot work, like leading the initiative 594, which closed the background check loophole in Washington state in 2014. This year, if you haven't already heard, and I hope you have, we are leading the charge to keep guns out of dangerous hands with Initiative 1491, which will create extreme risk protection orders. These orders allow family members and law enforcement, the people most likely to see early warning signs of crisis, to petition a court to temporarily remove firearms from individuals in danger of harming themselves or others, addressing issues around domestic violence, homicides, around mass shootings, and around suicide, which is the most prevalent form of gun deaths in our, in our state and in our country. In 2014, we started the push here in Washington to give power to voters to strengthen gun laws, and that movement is spreading. Just this year, four states have common sense reforms to gun laws on the ballot. And the momentum is growing every day. We've brought petitions tonight to help get I-1491 on the ballot, and I hope if you haven't already on your way in, that on your way out, you have a chance to sign your name right there. Thank you, sir. <laughs> What we do here in Washington can have a real impact, both to making our community safer and in showing the rest of the country that voters want stronger gun laws. But we need people like each of you and people like Pamela to keep the public dialogue about guns in America ongoing. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Pamela. Pamela is an award-winning writer and cultural commentator. She is the author of four books, including her newest, The Gunning of America, Business and the Making of a Gun Culture and Marriage Conf Confidential, sorry, which received a starred review from Publishers Weekly and was deemed flat out brilliant by the Washington Post. Pamela has kept her regular columns for both Big Think Magazine and Psychology Today, and received several fellowships to support her research, including awards from the Mellon Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Please join me in giving a warm welcome, a warm town hall welcome, to Pamela Haig. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for being here tonight. I hear you guys have some freeway issues, so I'm really grateful that you're here. Um, in case you didn't guess it from looking at me, I'm not the typical person who ends up writing a big book on guns. Uh, and in fact, every time my friends ask me, why did you write on guns, I swear I'm gonna write about kittens or chocolate or something we can all agree on the next time. Um, I actually came to the gun story through a ghost story when I was a graduate student in New Haven I heard the story of Sarah Winchester. Now, Sarah was the daughter-in-law of the rifle king, Oliver Winchester. And legend had it that she was a spiritualist who believed that she was being haunted by the ghosts of everyone killed by Winchester rifles, which unfortunately was a lot of people. And I was just captivated by this ghost story, and I looked into it a little bit, then I set it aside uh, for several years. And then uh, Sandy Hook happened, and in that moment, just as an historian, my mind kind of wandered back to Sarah. But this time I thought, maybe I'm starting with the wrong end of this story, and maybe the more mysterious part of this story really is Oliver Winchester and the gun industry, about which I knew nothing. 
Um, I think I started this project sort of with the usual cliches in my head. Um, if you free associate about the history of guns in America, you probably have a whole set of images from Buffalo Bill, John Wayne, uh, maybe the NRA, Columbine. And I think it all blurs into a kind of fugue where it just feels like we've always had guns, we've always loved guns, and, and that's the end of the story. Um, the political discussion around guns today is very dominated by constitutional debates. Um, I write in my book that we could be forgiven if we just believe that guns sprang fully formed from the head of the Second Amendment. Um, but they don't. Um, the Second Amendment didn't invent, patent, sell, mass produce, uh, promote, or um, distribute guns. The gun industry did that. Uh, so the bigger riddle, even than Sarah and her ghosts, that emerged for me was why this entity in our gun culture, with the very most to gain from promoting and celebrating and selling the gun, is really the most invisible when we think about the history of guns in our culture. Um, so people will say to me, you know, guns in America are all about the exercise of Second Amendment rights, to which I say, well, what are you going to exercise those rights with? Um, who makes those guns? Where do they come from? So I really started wanting to ask some very basic, uh, simple questions about guns. Um, who, who started this industry? Did they find it an easy industry or a challenging one? How did they get started in guns in the first place? Uh, where were they selling them and to whom and how many? And these only sound like simple questions. <laughs> they, they unraveled very quickly into much more complicated questions. So if you remember any one thing from what I'm gonna share tonight, I hope it's simply this, that um, guns in America are not just an amendment, uh, they are also a business. Um, they weren't just an exceptional part of our political culture, they have also been in some ways a very unexceptional part of our commercial culture and our economic life. So tonight I'm gonna to try to redirect your vision from the streets of the Wild West to the factory floors of New England, and I hope that that will challenge you to rethink when and how and why we became a gun culture. So I'm gonna start off here with um, Oliver Winchester, who factors very heavily in my book. Uh, he was one of a handful of men who made the guns that made the gun culture. Uh, he first invested in guns in 1855. Uh, as far as we know, he had never owned or displayed a gun. He had made his fortune as a men's shirt manufacturer in New Haven. Um, he's misremembered as the inventor of the rifle that bears his name, uh, but he wasn't. His inventive contribution to America was an 1848 patent for a collar on a men's shirt that, in his words, remedied the evil of the too tight neckband. <laughs> um, incidentally, Samuel Colt, Samuel Colt came into the gun business through weird pathways too. He uh, opened his first factory in 1836 after he'd been on a tour um, demonstrating the amusing effects of nitrous oxide under the name Dr. Cole. So Oliver Winchester started out needing uh, customers. And at first he sought the most elegant and obvious market for his rifle, which he always saw not as a civilian weapon, but as a weapon for what he called the romance of war. Um, so he sought business from the US military, but he could have taken a lesson from Colt there. Um, Colt had been wooing military business for decades with mixed results, um, largely owing to the fact that, in his words, the military uh, was a set of asses. Um, he eventually got so bitter about their lack of enthusiasm for these new multi-firing arms that he wrote to his half-brother, you had better blow out your brains at once and manure some honest man's ground with your carcass than become a govern government officer. So I guess he was bitter. <laughs> But the civilian market wasn't that good either. One of the interesting things for me in doing this research is that uh, guns were a surprisingly tough business. I had this idea they're just flying off the shelves and everyone wanted a Colt. Colt's first factory went bankrupt in 1842 and he testified in London that he hadn't been profitable in the gun business until 1854. And part of the problem was simply that these arms weren't needed by the average American, multi-firing arms. But Oliver couldn't believe that the gun fogies in the military weren't interested in this repeater rifle, which was really a multi-firing semi-automatic kind of rifle. He wrote in Scientific American that uh, control of this repeater would enable any government to rule the world, so he never lacked for ambition. Um, in contrast, the Ordnance Department saw it as a great evil that used too much ammunition. And it's very interesting that the guns that would just 
sear their way into the American civilian gun culture, the Colts and the Winchesters, the Ordnance Department thought that they were all bound eventually to fade into oblivion, which did not happen. Even during the Civil War, Oliver Winchester never got a big government contract, but the Civil War was like this gun finishing school for him, and he learned these incredibly valuable lessons, being a first generation industrialist and gun capitalist about how the system worked. First, he wrote in his letters, maybe it would be better to scatter the guns, in his words, try to sell just to individuals rather than to groups or regiments, because that would build a demand and a market and an awareness of his gun. Um, the other valuable lesson that he learned um, was that a gun capitalist and industrialist who wanted to lash himself to the boom and bust of what he called a very spasmatic economy of war was going to be in trouble. Um, and Colt had already learned that, that grim lesson. Think for a minute about how the goals of a gun capitalist were very different than the goals of a general. For example, Colt had managed to sell some of his revolvers to uh, Colonel Harney in 1838, who used them to defeat the Seminoles in Florida. And Colt told a London audience afterwards, after Harney's victory, that that victory, though very glorious for the government, was exactly the reverse for me. For by exterminating the Indians and bringing the war rapidly to an end, the market for the arms was destroyed. It's a very blunt assessment of this economy. So Winchester, being a shrewd first-generation captain of industry, began to realize, well, maybe it's better to sell and produce steadily to individuals than to deal with trying to, to tie myself to the, the war economy, if there were enough demand. But after the Civil War, there was not enough demand. <laughs> demand was absolutely abysmal in the United States for guns. Um, the entire gun industry began a great struggle to survive. Many went bankrupt. And Oliver had just opened up a factory in New Haven in 1866, a new factory. And his compatriots in New Haven thought that he was insane, that they were aghast at the incredible folly of anyone thinking that a production of 200 guns a day could be sold. It was freely said that he had lost his reason. The plant would run for no more than three or four days a year. So that was their assessment of gun demand. So Oliver had to confront this question again, who's gonna buy these guns? This is a recurring question for the gun industry and kind of a surprising one. And at this point, Winchester and the other gun kings, Remington, Smith and Wesson and Colt, followed a path that Colt first trailblazed. Uh, they went abroad. And to me, this is one of the most striking findings from the gun archive. The American gun industry very much stayed alive and survived in key years around the Civil War, before and after the Civil War, not on an American market, but on international sales, uh, really to almost every corner of the world. So in a very real sense, the American gun economy and gun culture was part of this international global phenomenon of arming uh, the world, not just the country. Um, the Connecticut Valley in New England kind of became the gun breadbasket to the world. Um, Colt had first built his fortune from Russia to Sardinia to Siam. Um, Smith and Wesson stayed alive selling uh, their Model 3 for five years to the czar of the Russian Empire. And when you think about the typical American gun consumer, it's not Tsar Nicholas II. <laughs> you know, it's Buffalo Bill or uh, Charlton Heston. But in fact, without these international sales, the gun industry absolutely could not have survived. Uh, Remington relied most deeply on military sales, selling to France, Egypt, Spain, Cuba, Peru, Greece, Norway, Denmark, and many others. Winchester went gun expatriate as well. His business survived in 1870 by selling 20,000 guns to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and before that in 1866 by selling uh, repeaters to the Juarez Revolutionary Forces in Mexico. But the international good times didn't last forever. In 1879, Oliver reported to his board of directors that business had decreased. And in fact, Winchester's lowest sales ever before pre-World War I uh, were in 1875. Um, he was relying mostly on the domestic trade, he wrote, which was constantly increasing, but not there yet. Um, the domestic trade, of course, would be the US commercial gun market. Um, the West was certainly the most promising domestic commercial market. It was certainly better than New England. Uh, but guns didn't just sell themselves. 
Underneath these powerful legends of this very gun-violent, gunslinger American culture, there is another gun America. And in that gun America and in that gun history, the country's less gun-violent than we think, less heavily armed, and less in love with these fancy new modern weapons, the Winchesters and the Colts. And that's a part of our history that I think is really lost today, or maybe it's strangled. Uh, but it's definitely not part of our consciousness about guns. Um, and ironically, it's the archive of the gun business that really brings this struggle to arm the country to light and really brings to light the fact that, that um, it was a tough sell to arm America with these deadlier weapons. Um, Colts had these preferred dealers that they called allies, and they complained bitterly throughout the 1870s about having to sell way more pistols than they could possibly um, push. Another source points to run one reason why. It's the sales record of the country's largest gun merchant. And there we get a glimpse of the actual guns that settlers were taking with them as they went west. And like as not, they were opting for these more dowdy practical weapons, you know, an 1842 U.S. percussion musket, a Prussian 39 caliber musket, over the bling of, of the Winchesters and the Colts. Um, and one reason for that, I think, one reason why they're opting for those weapons is because they had very practical, dowdy views on guns, many of them. Um, in fact, the NRA was first founded in 1871 over um, alarm about American men's poor marksmanship. <laughs> so we weren't exactly the gun whisperers that we were cracked up to be. Um, many Americans still saw guns as tools. Uh, the gun industry was very attuned to market segmentation. They, they recognized a lot of different gun cultures and markets out there. And one of their biggest ones was uh, what the Winchester Company called the ordinary shooter, the farmer, who they reached through the American agriculturalist. At the same time, though, dime novels in the 1880s were beginning to build the gun mystique. Um, they were planting a seed that I think would really grow in the 20th century. And if there was one rule to writing a gun western dime novel, it was this. You had to do gun overkill. You had to exaggerate both the quantity of people killed and the quality of the violence. You had to take violence that in real life was often in, in, based in intoxication or anger or impulse and give it some sense, make it have some honor and, and righteousness and justice to it. There were 500 dime novels written about Buffalo Bill alone, and he ghost wrote some of them. And he admitted as much that this was the formula. He wrote to his publisher, I am sorry to have to lie so outrageously in this yarn. My hero has killed more Indians on one war trail than I have killed in all my life. But I understand this is what is expected of border tales. If you think the revolver and bowie knife are used too freely, you may cut out a fatal shot or stab whenever you deem it wise. <laughs> so that dime novel is kind of covering up the America that actually had less gun violence than, than was written. So the gun industry itself was also getting a feel for their modern consumer. Um, and it wasn't, a it wasn't the soldier, it was the, more the lone gunman. Um, just before his death in 1880, uh, Winchester started kind of individualizing his gun. He started promoting it by talking about its moral effect either upon an army or an individual, <laughs> either upon a party of men or one single man. Um, Winchester wrote about that, the moral effect of his rifle, um, a few times, and it was an intricate one. Uh, for Winchester, the customer, his life was lived alone in self-reliance and vulnerability. Um, his customer was, in Winchester's words, now a collection of single individuals traveling through a wild country. And his business would prosper after his death to the simple extent that he could convince other Americans that was their world too. So as the gun commercial market was developing in the 1870s and 1880s, some of the practices that haunt gun control advocates today were put in place. Um, one was a very elaborate distribution network using rail that uh, ran guns from the heart of the, the New England factories to key transit points in St. Louis and New Orleans, Lower Manhattan, uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, out to retailers, more on the fringes, and then ultimately to individuals who various, variously sold or lost or traded or gambled their guns away. So there is now a great distance between the gun maker and the gun customer um, just because of the nature of industry. It was a far cry from the intimacy of the gunsmith days. A second practice was anonymity. 
1875, a sporting uh, magazine wrote that the British were far more rigid in the scrutiny of the character of their gun customers than Americans were. Um, they accept orders only when they were satisfied of their customers' responsibility and honor. Um, our gun trade was very anonymous. Um, dealers might record sold to a stranger or sold to our Cuban friends <laughs> or to be in Corpus Christi, Texas. This was all very common. Um, a Colt dealer summarized, if a gentleman came into my office and handed me the money for 1,000 Colts, I would grab him in my arms and be glad to see him. What he was going to do with them, of course, would be none of my business. So I had come into this research with a vague idea that the gun culture emerged very much out of exceptionalism, but as I read more about the gun industry, I see that it was also a legacy of unexceptionalism. It was a legacy of these key years when the gun was very much like any other commodity, both internationally and domestically. Um, for all intents and purposes, it was like a shoe or a plow um, or a widget. Now, the early 1900s bring us to a turning point because maybe things could have gone either way. Um, big changes are happening in the country. We're urbanized. The frontier has closed. The economy is more corporate and more settled and sedentary. Um, and the algorithm for the gun industry was always pretty brutal. Um, guns are made to last. Uh, scientific efficiency was allowing them to be produced faster and faster, um, but at a time when they seemed to be needed less. So why wasn't this incredibly bad news for the gun industry? And you also have to wonder, why should guns flourish past the time of a frontier? There are countries that have had frontiers, but they don't have this ongoing gun culture after that point. Um, and maybe civilian firearms were a technology that would just fade with the frontier. Uh, New York judge George Holt called the pistol in the early 1900s the greatest nuisance of modern American life, and plenty of Americans agreed with him. Um, some of those Americans significantly were first focused on reforming the gun business and not the gun owner. Um, during and after World War I, the gun industry emerged as merchants of death. Um, and a lot of the first proposals to deal with guns really attacked the industry. It was about uh, Texas passed a law to tax pistol profits of 50%. The American Bar Association, under the slogan, if nobody had a gun, nobody would need a gun, proposed just to prohibit the manufacture of handguns. Um, a Missouri representative said maybe they shouldn't be advertised in detective magazines. Um, some even advocated for nationalizing the industry and just take it out of the hands of, of the commercial enterprise altogether. And the first firearms legislation in 1927 banned the shipment of guns through the U.S. Postal Service on the business crippling logic that since the guns emanated from New England, that would shut down the business. Um, there was also an emerging resistance in the 1910s to um, using auto-loading shotguns for hunting. Um, there was legislation introduced in, also in 1917 against bird hunters using auto-loading guns. And when a Winchester executive uh, learned of this, he excitedly brainstormed back to headquarters, the best way to stop such legislation will be to talk with the congressman who introduced it, <laughs> in other words, to lobby, <laughs> which seemed like a wild idea at the time. Um, so America is getting more gun conscious at this time. They're getting, some are getting more con gun conscious and averse to guns and saying they don't really have a place in modern life, but others are getting a little more infatuated with guns. And there's a sim simultaneous turn away from guns as well as a deepening of the gun mystique and all of its intangible emotional values. Um, part of this deepening of the gun mystique came from the gun industry itself. Um, sales were evolving at this time from a mission of just fulfilling the demand that was out there to creating demand, creating a desire for the product. And the gun, like every other industry at the time, was very invested in this project. In one of the internal sales bulletins, they wrote, it was the salesman's new task to stoke a desire in the customer's mind that becomes action in his purse. So Winchester expanded its marketing department. Um, it sort of caught on to the kind of hyperventilation of advertisement in the modern style. They wrote at one point, I don't want to brag, but we are engaged at the present minute in the greatest commercial venture in the history of this country, probably in the history of the world. <laughs> um, 
The Sandy Hook families, to step into the present time for a minute, are now seeking discovery uh, to read Remington's marketing materials. But one of the beauties of doing history is that these kinds of materials are readily available in the archive if you care to look at them. I mean, historically, Winchester executives tirelessly wrote of how to develop gun demand, um, not just fulfill what already existed. And this was a very ordinary part of their business, really of any business. Um, they were, they instruct, instructed retailers that they would be in a healthy merchandising condition when they had way more guns on hand than they could easily sell. They spoke of demand getting properly worked up for particular models that they felt were underperforming what they thought it should be selling. Um, at one point, they sought marketing insight from the liquor people, as they called them, who tried to perpetuate their business by educating young men to the use of their products. Very immoral of them, of course, but mighty good business. <laughs> We also see in the early 1900s the emergence of this new customer in the Winchester vocabulary who's also known in the shooting press as the gun crank. Um, the gun crank was defined as someone who was particularly and peculiarly interested in guns. And at first, the Winchester company considered him a pest. But they urged the sales force to take the time to examine him from all angles and maybe use him to boost sales. Um, the crank wanted to talk and ventilate views on guns they wrote and was interested in all of the new guns that were coming out on the market. So Winchester didn't quite understand it yet, but the gun crank was close to their ideal modern consumer. Um, a big change was underway in the gun industry. It was shifting from the customer who needed guns but didn't especially love them to a customer who loved guns but didn't especially need them. And this transformation was evident throughout the Winchester archives. They started sending uh, missionaries, as did Remington, to stoke zeal and uh, get converts to the gun, and called them missionaries. Uh, they started uh, releasing chromolithographic calendars that sold guns with these emotionally charged predicament scenes between man and foe. And this change from kind of the ordinary shooter to the gun crank was also evident in the shifts in the advertisement, uh, which really moved from in the 1800s an emphasis on how guns worked to in the 1900s an emphasis on how guns made you feel. So an ad in the 1800s might have been literal instructions, how does this gun work? Uh, but then in 1921, we have this ad from the Literary Digest. You know your son wants a gun, but you don't know how much he wants it. He can't tell you. It's beyond words. So masculinity was a big part of this modern mystique. Um, the gun shifted from a predominantly but not exclusively male tool more into a male totem. Uh, Winchester had an ad campaign that talked about the real boy. Every real boy wants a gun. Um, it's a natural instinct. They were kind of drawing on the vocabulary of psychology, and it's a natural instinct for a boy to want a gun, and he'll want to get his hands on one sooner or later for that reason. Um, in fact, Winchester's most ambitious post-World War I marketing plan, they shorthanded in their letters as their boy plan. And it urged retailers to send the company a list of names of boys in your town so we can send this illustrated letter under your own name. And the company planned to reach precisely 3,363,537 boys between the ages of 10 and 15 this way. Read this letter, put yourself in the place of a boy of 14. Would you let another day go by before calling on your dealer? So the industry was basically seeking a variety of ways to keep the gun meaningful and relevant and loved in this post-frontier world where maybe it had less utility than it had before. Uh, they found new frontiers with the old ones closed, so Colt advertised to automobilists that they should have a gun with them if they're on the road. Um, they sought women customers, certainly not for the first or the last time. That's been a market that the gun industry has wanted to develop for a long time and still does today. Um, they sold the history of the gun also as part of the appeal of the product. Um, Smith & Wesson had this interesting ad campaign called Makers of History where they kind of airbrushed their, their pistols into these scenes in history where the gun had had no part, like the first flight, you know, in Kitty Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> um, in its internal sales bulletins to dealers, Winchester even perfected the best ritual to hand the gun to a customer, the right way to stimulate desire, as they put it. 
They invited the dealer to imagine the customer feeling the gun's comfortable cuddle to his shoulder, its smooth brown stock to his cheek. So you read a bulletin like that and you realize that this modern relationship between the customer and the gun was intimate. I mean, it was almost a love story. This confluence of gun quantity and gun love obviously was not conjured out of the gun industry uh, in thin air. A lot of things went into it. But the gun industry is a major and untold part of this story of how we've arrived where we are today. Um, one answer among many to why Americans love guns is simply because we were invited to at a moment when the gun had lost some of its more practical utility in our lives. So would the gun survive in this post-frontier world? Um, and would it thrive in a modern style or would it fade? I guess we know the answer to that. Um, Winchester's annual gun sales in 1914 were 30 times higher in, than in 1875, and they were 11 times higher than in 1880. Its highest sales ever before World War I were in 1906 at 324,000. Um, all told, the gun industry between the years 1899 and 1993 added a total of 223 million more guns to the cumulative gun load. Okay, so if I were going to drop you back in time, at what point would you sort of recognize our gun politics? Because I don't think you, there were many in the 1800s. I don't think you'd recognize that. I think it's really here in the 1920s and the 1930s that you might feel at home uh, because it's at this juncture that the gun really begins to get kind of demonized and valorized in ways that we would recognize today. This is a time when we start talking about more than guns when we talk about guns. For one thing, the sheer quantity of gun violence in the 1920s was growing. In the 20th century, it was growing. Um, guns were responsible for about 71% of homicides in the mid-1920s. They'd been responsible for maybe 25% in the 1800s. Uh, the United States had 10,050 homicides in 1928, and uh, France had 520, and Great Britain had 284. The guns that armed the bootlegging, roaring 20s are actually incredibly easy to trace. Um, most all of them came from one contract that the Colts company fulfilled for auto ordnance. These were Tommy guns, submachine guns, and auto ordnance held a patent for them. And they were going to make 15,000 of them to sell to Argentina. It was a military contract. That contract fell through, so the guns just floated in the commercial market where almost each and every gangster <laughs> eventually was using one of these guns. So at this time too, the politics are beginning to take on a very familiar form. Um, the merchants of death idea was really shining a spotlight on the gun industry, but at the same time, another spotlight was getting shown on this emerging kind of fractious, hostile relationship between the gun owner and um, what the NRA called the human conduct governor who wanted to regulate. Um, one of my favorite finds from the gun archive was a folder of press releases in the Colts Company archive. And these were press releases from the 1920s, the late 1920s, that were basically defending the point of view of industry and the gun industry. And many of them would feel right at home on a bumper sticker today. Um, gun control legislation would only restrict the honest gun owner and not, quote, the professional gun toter, the dope peddler, the card shark, and numerous other lawbreakers. Um, in other words, when guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. Um, we see early models of familiar caricatures. Um, guns were the firearms evil. Gun control advocates became slobbering sentimentalists, would-be saviors, and lounge lizard anemics who <laughs> belittled the old-fashioned American citizen. <laughs> um, there's a precursor to guns don't kill people. People do. This was already developing. Uh, the press release included the line, the gun was an animate pistol, a piece of harmless metal. It's not the instruments of crime which we should legislate against. It's the condition which encourages crime. The 1934 National Firearms Act uh, was considered the first serious effort at federal gun control. Um, at this time, the NRA wasn't a, a lobbying powerhouse. Um, its president was an Olympic marksman, and he had been a volunteer up until two years before this point. 
And um, the NRA voice wasn't as categorical as it is today. They were supporting legislation against submachine guns, um, but not anything else. Um, at the same time, you can sort of catch a glimpse in this moment in 1934 of this big political galaxy getting born uh, because the NRA was really ahead of the game in terms of organizing for gun rights and they were developing modern techniques and messages. For example, they had instructed all of their members to send letters to their representatives against the legislation and congressmen found this technique so weird and annoying, this kind of direct mail technique, that they said they felt bombarded by these letters and kind of insulted by them. So it was kind of a new technique at the time. And in this letter, the NRA was developing a kind of slippery slope argument. Um, they worried that eventually legislation would apply to quote any firearm and that every rifle and shotgun owner in the country will find himself paying a special tax and having himself fingerprinted and photographed for the federal rogues gallery every time he buys or sells a gun of any description. So that's very familiar, but it was in 1934. Ingeniously, the NRA analogized in their magazine, the American Rifleman, they analogized all guns to a bundle of sticks and that, that bundle was being broken one stick at a time by regulators. Um, and they warned the rifle owner that his would be the last firearm to go. So here the rifle almost became an alibi for the submachine gun and the hunter the alibi for the gangster because all of these eclectic guns were getting bundled up into one entity, the gun with one shared political fate. Like a template for a part of a Winchester rifle, much of the dye of the gun culture was cast. Over the next decades, all of these themes would deepen and the gun mystique would deepen as well. Um, but many of the essential themes were already there. In fact, much of what we know about guns in America, I think, comes from the 1900s talking about the 1800s. It comes from the Cold War imagination reflecting on the frontier. The sheer quantity of Western, Western guns and Western gun stories in the 1900s, mid-1900s, is just staggering. Uh, publishers sold 35 million paperback Westerns in the 1950s. Uh, the Marx Company debuted the first of its 134 Wild West play sets in 1951. Eight of the top 10 TV primetime shows in 1959 were Westerns. Hollywood released over 1,400 Western movies between 1935 and 1960. And of 1,951 publications about gunslingers and one bibliography that I worked with, all but 241 of those were published in the 1900s, uh, the greatest number in the 1950s. So the story of our gun culture is perhaps not so much about the gun that won the West, but more about what I call the West that won the gun. And this is the collection of fables and legends and powerful myths that are braided together through advertisement and film and pulp fiction and television and movies and the gun industry's own visible hand um, to, to deepen the mystique of the gun at a time when that became important to keeping it in modern life. Um, so I'll leave you here with one thought. Uh, maybe we could say that we even staged, filmed, acted, televised, debated, and advertised our way into a gun culture more than we shot our way into one. Thanks. Hi. Uh, do, you, do you think that the, the American culture today by nature is kind of an angry culture, like to, to me, mm -hmm. uh, every time there is a big uh, incident of guns and killing, I feel like rather than looking at ourselves, we, we somehow like oh, want to blame the gun, like it, it's not us, mm -hmm. it's the gun. I mm -hmm. can argue with you that actually, mm -hmm. uh, like drugs, like cocaine mm -hmm. and heroin, if America did not produce any guns of its own, I think there would be still the same number of guns in the country, but just coming from somewhere else. Mm. Because of something that's in our character, more I, or less. I, and I, think, <laughs> I think the lifestyle that we have mm -hmm. created is putting so much pressure on the people mm -hmm. that they somehow explode in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a really profound question. I certainly can't, can't answer that entirely. Um, one of the things I talk about in my book is the tension that some of our ideals put on people, that we have ideals of individualism, of equality, and in some cases the gun kind of steps in when that individualism falls short. You know, the cult was always called the great equalizer. 
Um, so there's a lot of a democratic attachment to guns, that guns can equalize people who aren't being treated as equal or, or made equal in other ways. Um, it's certainly true that the mystique of the gun really gets developed, I think, more in the 1950s, also around Cold War politics. It became a way to talk about American values and um, the individual standing up against the authoritarian state. So, yeah, I mean, the, the gun's definitely tapping into a set of values and also just a set of struggles around equality and, and safety that are there even without the gun, for sure. Um, and it's certainly not the case that we didn't have a problem with violence before guns. I mean, in the 1800s, it was fists or bricks or axe handles. I mean, there were different ways of exercising this, this violence. So the guns aren't entirely responsible for that. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this. It's helpful to me. Thank you. Um, I spent about 35 years in Newark, New Jersey. And I'm actually still related to people there, and I hear about it often. There have been uh, one homicide a week since the beginning of this year, and that's gone on for about 10 years. Um, it's horrific, and um, it seems to me that actually guns are being seeded in certain places. Um, so I just wanted to kind of lay that out. But two other important things. One is um, we have Big Five uh, sporting goods store here. Mm -hmm. And I would love to buy things from them, but their inside pages are filled with guns, mm -hmm. cheap guns. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to them, actually, not to send me any more emails mm -hmm. because I can't buy from them. Mm -hmm. um, the other last thing I'd like to say about mm -hmm. um, when Sandy Hook happened, mm -hmm. I looked up, you probably did this too, I looked up the gun manufacturer yeah. and that they had been owned by a group in Maine and mm -hmm. then they were bought by Cerebus. Or I Cerebus. think Remington is a parent company, it's Bushmaster. And uh, in the long run, um, the president of the company that actually owns them mm -hmm. now, they said they were gonna stop manufacturing those guns but they didn't because the demand was so great afterwards. And um, Afterwards? After. And um, so they still haven't divested from that gun. Um, yes. But the, the person who was the president of that board was Dan Quayle. Oh. So a lot of people oh. don't know these things. Yes. But um, I, I, I was fascinated by your point about international gun sales. Yeah. And I think that's still going on today, largely. Yeah, and also importing today. I mean, I'm not an expert on the gun industry today, but um, that was one of the things that most surprised me. I had no idea that guns were really part of this international commerce and really the first leading edge of globalization well, um, at that time. Guns and drugs under Reagan, Dan Quayle is, the, is on the board of the NRA. So they're all connected, guns are going everywhere and they are damaging individuals. So thank you for the thank context you. for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when uh, when I was a kid, I uh, I took uh, gun gun uh, at, uh, marksmanship training at, in a uh, an, uh, a um, U.S. Armory in mm -hmm. Brooklyn that was and they had a program that was uh, the the NRA and the Boy Scouts had a program and it would focus largely on safety mm -hmm. and uh, I won a you know marksmanship uh, mm -hmm. award and it was uh, focused but but there was a tight relationship between the military and the NRA and the Boy Scouts in, and the focus was preparing you for, you know, maybe future service to the country. Mm -hmm. Now it seems that they, mm -hmm. uh, they, they're only concerned with scaring the hell out of people and maybe even making them afraid of the government. You have to have an AK-47 in case you have to fight as a guerrilla in your fantasy world against the U.S. military. <laughs> uh, so I think they've, they're constantly talking about the, mm -hmm. the, the uh, Second Amendment, which actually says a well-regulated well -regulated, militia yeah. being necessary, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, right to bear arms, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, is there any possibility that, that we'll reach a point where the government, maybe after a terrorist uh, incident or another Sandy Hook, uh, will say, okay, you own a gun, you're in the militia. You mm. have to be because you're a citizen. Now let's focus on what's mm -hmm. the militia do? Whatever the county or the state chooses it to do as long as it's focused on safety. Oh. Could that be a way of focusing people's 
uh, in an, into a more community-related uh, uh, positive way, and especially focusing on safety, because if they did nothing more than just put gun locks on most of these things, you wouldn't have two-year-olds shooting their mothers. Right. Well, that's an interesting idea, but I think that, as you have would probably agree, kind of cuts against the grain of some of the political mystique and appeal of the gun today. Um, I mean, I live in Baltimore, uh, and Maryland obviously is a very blue state. And, um, you know, I know people who, who aren't really interested in shooting per se, but they're simply buying guns kind of as a statement against the government, against wanting to be in that community that you're imagining. So the point you're making about the tie between the military is, is really profound because historically, you know, that's how Oliver Winchester thought about his weapon. This was a weapon of war. And plenty of Americans looked at, at guns that way at first, whether for, for good or bad. They saw them as very tied to something that was an, an act of, of uh, war and, and being in the military, not the civilian market. Um, it's really interesting how much work went into developing that civilian market and how much it was really almost, you know, for Winchester and to some extent for Colt, kind of the market of second or third resort, you know, because they didn't get the military contracts they wanted and then the international sales dried up. Um, but one of the unique things in the 20th century is how much gun ownership is severed from that esprit de corps, you know, from this idea that you mostly use guns as part of a regiment, you know, as part of a, an act of war. Um, that is very much the essence of what's very unique in the United States, is that civilian appeal and the political symbolism of that. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I was curious if you, in researching this book, uh, you spoke about the domestic uh, mm -hmm. gun growth. I was curious if you looked into, say, other countries to see if they had similar patterns. I know like yeah. there's other gun cultures such as Pakistan mm -hmm. or Yemen that have a really strong gun culture. I'm right. curious, did you look into that? If, is, if they have similar sort of capitalist uh, um, uh, yeah, introduction to... I didn't look at those specific examples, but I did struggle a lot with this question. It's a really good question because why aren't other countries in the same position that we are? But one answer to that, it's important to keep in mind that really in the 1800s, America was so ahead of the game in terms of gun industry and gun manufacturing that even though we were initially dependent on Europe for our firearms, we quickly surpassed you know, the great gun shops in, in Birmingham, England, and Belgium. And these countries became more dependent on the US for their needs to the extent that um, during World War I, Winchester was producing Enfield rifles for the British before it could even get to, to US contracts. Um, so some of the pressures in the United States are simply because we have more gun industry. Um, in 1934, when gun regulation was being debated, one of the most powerful rationales against that regulation was that the US government had become dependent on private industry for its public defense. And this was true. So the War Department said, well, they can't sit around waiting for wars. <laughs> they need to be able to make a profit, you know, so they'll be available to defend all of us in a time of war. And that meant unregulated commercial enterprise. That kind of pressure that, that kind of stoked the commercial market here and made it very unregulated, that didn't apply as much to the countries that had become more dependent on our arms. They didn't have that industry exerting that pressure. So, you know, in Switzerland, for example, gun fluency is vast and guns are a major part of the culture, but it is still very tied to the militia. And again, here, it's like that's the thing that's so distinct. The guns really became about the individual gun ownership and it wasn't as woven into the public uh, good. And sorry to interrupt, just we have time for these three more questions. Okay. So the title of this presentation was Fixing the American Gun Culture? No. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> Isn't that the title? Oh, sorry. I'm still waiting for the fix. Um, well, I can talk about that. Okay. I, Let me ask my question yeah. and then maybe you can lead into that. Um, okay. So it seems to me that the attractiveness of guns, the appeal of guns and gun shooting, 
is very much supported by the popular culture, particularly Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of movies like The Matrix, where there's just tremendous amounts of gun firings, yeah. Yeah. and that that's made glamorous yeah. through those means. And I'm wondering if your study of the history of this, and the marketing, the, mm -hmm. the building up of the attractiveness of guns included that, and whether you think that has a significant role or a minor role, and whether there's anything we can do about it. Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, that is definitely a big part of the book, and it was there early on. Um, I think there's a vague illusion, maybe I just started with this, but I think others probably would agree. This kind of illusion, oh, guns just sell themselves, you know, Americans have always loved guns. Uh, you know, the fact that we have a gun industry shows that everyone wants guns. And I really think that's a misconception. It was a huge amount of ongoing work for all of the big giants in the gun industry to find markets, to develop them, and in doing that, absolutely, I think that all of the energy around the turn of the century and in the 20th century really is toward using advertisements and, and tapping into pop culture to develop that. There was a movie called Winchester 73, and the Winchester company was, was with Jimmy Stewart. They were very involved in, I guess, what we would call product placement or cross-promotion now, and the gun industry itself was very attuned to how to use history as well and how to tap into um, a more violent version of America's past and to use that. So I, you know, I think that that absolutely played a key role from very early on and that otherwise guns might have not had a prominent place in the kind of society we became in the 20th century. I mean, it was a struggle to make them relevant in new terms. And a lot of those new terms were about glamour. They were about the desire for the gun. They are about these very intangible things that are absolutely compelling today, like they've never been compelling before. I mean, I think today there's even more of a political mystique to it as well. So... Yeah, I think that goes way back, particularly trying to develop the, the female customer. Remington was trying to market to women in 1850. You know, Winchester did that at every step of the way. Um, I think now that market is more robust, but that's been like 160 years in the making. I get so tired of hearing uh, people quote the Second Amendment. It's my right <laughs> under the Second Amendment, my rights. Uh, the Second Amendment really doesn't exist. Uh, we have a militia called the, um, what is it, the State National Guard. National Guard. Um, the Second Amendment was uh, written for, during the fledgling government, for the citizen soldier to protect the government. Um, and we, we, just, we just don't need it. Was it decoupled at some time in the 50s, 1950s? I've was it I've decoupled. So you had you have the NRA say, quoting the last part mm -hmm. of the Second oh, yeah, Amendment, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but somehow mysteriously the militia. Mm -hmm. Believe me, if anyone wants to form a militia against this government, they'll be taken out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I really yeah. think so. The government's not going to, you know. So it doesn't exist anymore. The citizen soldier is in the. Uh, the uh, founding fathers were very, very ambivalent about an army. They didn't trust the army. So I think we need to revisit just what the founding fathers' intent was. And this business of a small government, well, we don't need this too big, and taking away uh, people's consumer rights, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. I think we need to revisit what the founding fathers had in mind. We need to, def to understand what is? I just get so tired of it. it's my right, the Second Amendment. But it's wasn't yeah, it decoupled. I mean, it's, it's difficult to say something new on this topic because right now there's this gravitational pull back to exactly what you're describing, uh, which is that this is framed almost entirely around the Second Amendment. And it's interesting as an historian to be reading through an archive from the gun business. And I could count on a hand how many times the Second Amendment came up, you know, either as uh, something to comment on or as a sales point or as a, you know, contemplation of um, the gun industry's place in the world. I mean, it was simply a slumbering giant. It was really a non-issue uh, for, for so much of this history. 
And uh, I'm hoping that that's one of the things this book is accomplishing. It's simply to focus on this other thing that guns were. I mean, regardless of one's view about the Second Amendment today, that Second Amendment did not do historically what we think it did. It did not promote the guns. It did not sell guns. It did not actually, I think, make Americans want to own guns. Um, there are many other things that did that. So, you know, by the time you get to the 1920s, you can kind of see references of the Second Amendment creeping in um, in the, even, you know, the NRA literature and even in the gun industry a bit. But before that point, all of these other factors were really building the gun culture. So, but right now it is the Second Amendment and that absolutely dominates it. You can be talking about any other thing with guns and someone's gonna get it back to the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, I don't know if you've studied the contemporary gun um, industry, but does the U.S. individual consumer, the retail market, does it buoy all of the gun manufacturers in terms of what their economic viability is today? And then the second question is, the economic rents from the sale of arms, mm -hmm. does it accrue to a mass number of people or is there a handful of people that are amassing that wealth? Hmm. Well, I don't want to overstep my expertise there. I'm not entirely versed on what's going on with the gun industry today. I mean, it was never as profitable as tobacco. Um, and my sense is that uh, right now, the gun industry is much more fractured. There are more smaller producers uh, out there and um, that it's still very much reliant on uh, civilian, civilian sales. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.